focus on the work that we've done in the last two years and the last, certainly the last diving season, the last 12 months, on establishing protected wreck diver trails, both real ones, physical ones on the seabed, but also virtual ones, virtual reality ones, on two. The Holland Number no. 5, which is a submarine at the bottom, uh, and the Normans Bay wreck, a big cannon site, uh, which is there's a snippet of uh, in the top of this slide. So they're both protected wrecks under the Protection of Wrecks Act, uh, and they're both diveable in one day. So we can do, we can visit both of these uh, protected wrecks in one day, one on a slack tide in the morning and one on a slack tide in the afternoon. And certainly since at least 2011, we've run many trips every year, several trips a year, weather allowing, uh, where we take visiting divers out to these sites, uh, and they do that. We give them a briefing in the morning on each of, or, and in the afternoon on each of the wrecks, and they go and dive it. They're not tasked necessarily to do any work. If they want to take photographs or videos, they can, uh, of course, no problem at all. Uh, but we're not physically tasking them with work. So it's providing access to the, the designated wrecks. Uh, so one of the very different experiences, and there are many people in the room that have done these with us, they're very different experiences. The Holland 5 submarine is an intact submarine sitting bolt upright in 30 to 34 meters of water, depending on the tide, in visibility that is normally pretty good. I mean, normally four, five, six, eight sometimes meters uh, visibility. The Norfolk's Bay Wreck is a completely different animal. Uh, it's quite shallow, 10 to 12 meters. It's a dispersed site of, of cannon on the seabed over about 50 meters long, 10 meters wide. And the visibility is normally shockingly bad. Um, in the briefing, we might say, you'll see a cannon. Yeah, well, sometimes you might feel a cannon. Uh, yeah, this may be the oldest cannon you've ever felt. Uh, there's something along those lines. Uh, and with funding from Historic England, we've uh, been working to set up physical diver trails and virtual diver trails uh, on both of these sites. I'm going to concentrate to, for the beginning on the Holland 5 submarine, which is, and the reason I've done that is because that's our first dive of the day. That's when we take people out to this, it's the first one we do. We follow the principle of deepest dive first, so we do that one uh, on the first slack. Sometimes that means the boat you know, ropes off at 6.30 in the morning, sometimes we get a nice lie in. It's, here it is, uh, in all its glory, motoring along on the surface. Uh, it's made of Siemens grade steel, so it's good stuff. It's made the same steel that the fourth road bridge was made from. It's a dinky little thing though, it's a tiny little um, submarine for uh, a crew of eight. So it's only about 60, well, 63 feet long on the seabed and the visibility allows as you dive down, as you get to about 20 meters underwater, sometimes you can see the whole thing in front of you from one side uh, to the other, from bow to stern. Uh, there's a single torpedo tube opening at the bow end that would have carried three to five torpedoes uh, with a test depth of about 100 feet. Now actually it sits now in about 100 feet of water and it sits completely in bolt upright with its conning tower pointing upwards and it sits really where it should have been. Where, and it's a brilliant experience for diver thinking that that's its maximum kind of operating depth. Uh, here they are, the crew uh, sitting, one of them coming out of the conning tower. Uh, no life jackets, as you'll notice. This is in the Eastern Solent, uh, with kind of Leon Solent in the background. Um, designed by John Philip Holland, an early submarine pioneer. We heard from Peter Holt yesterday about the resurgent submarine that sank off real on its way down to trials with the Admiralty uh, down in Portsmouth. Uh, John Philip Holland was actually an Irish teacher and engineer who was building submarines for the Fenian Brotherhood in the USA to actually sink British ships. Um, but when, uh, uh, when struggled to get paid, <laughs> and struggled to get any financing, uh, he actually then, in the 1900s, uh, sold his designs to the Royal Navy, uh, so sort of decided to follow the economics rather than the politics, uh, and um, sold his designs to the Royal Navy. Now, you know, they, whether the Royal Navy were reluctantly going in, whether they were uh, trying to really develop submarine warfare, uh, well, you know, they spent a lot of money on these, on the Holland-class submarines. They certainly were probably influenced by the Hunley, the H.L. Hunley sinking the Housatonic earlier uh, in, or, uh, in, the, in the century uh, in America, and the French were designing and building submarines, so the Admiralty probably had no real choice uh, but to also look at submarine as a weapon of war. Now, being from this period, we're very lucky that we have engineers' drawings, but we also have some physical examples of John Philip Holland's work. Uh, if you go to the Patterson Museum in New Jersey, you can see his very first ever prototype uh, of a submarine which was designed for him to actually go in. Uh, well, that looks very small to me in terms of going in. Uh, would have been very cramped, one-man submarine. Uh, you've got the Fenian Ram, uh, which is again in Patterson Museum in New Jersey, which is the precursor to the Holland. Now this one is actually called the Holland one, 
but we also have a Holland one, which is confusing, but there are two called the same thing. Uh, but the Royal Navy had its own Holland one, which is the prototype of the one that we're, we're diving on. Uh, and I came across several years ago, I came across in the Science Museum on a day trip with my kids. Uh, they hate me taking them to museums. Uh, this, this model uh, of a Holland class submarine, where they have quite a small section about submarines about them. So we have the engineer's drawings uh, of the Holland class. There's only one set of drawings for this class of submarine, though. The Holland one is the prototype, uh, and then there are four others, Holland three, uh, two, three, four, and five. And we know that for a cost of £35,000 at the time, Holland five was built by Vickers at Barrow and Furness, uh, and she was launched in the June of 1902. And in fact, the Holland five, along with the Holland three, were actually commissioned into the Royal Navy before Holland 1, 2 and 4, which were still being worked at the time. So when the Royal Navy Submarine Museum in Gosport say they've got the Royal Navy's first submarine, well, you know, arguably you could say that actually Holland 5, alongside Holland 3, being commissioned first, are the Royal Navy's first submarines. We know a little bit about uh, submarine warfare, submarine development, the testing that took place, the sea trials, the sort of using it to creep up on surface ships to prove that it would work. We know that she was used for explosive tests in 1907, which basically means that she was being uh, um, used pretty much as a, a, as a target practice, as, uh, as a gunnery target. She's laid up in 1910, and then they decide to tow her. Uh, in 1912, she's towed from Portsmouth, down the south coast, along the south coast, heading towards Sheerness, when she sinks under tow. We know she was under tow by the barge Enterprise. Uh, uh, we know there is no, because she's already been decommissioned, we know there is no inquiry, there's no inquest, there's no, no records other than this. This is the single line entry at the National Archives at Kew that I found on a visit with um, Sheila, in fact, uh, on one of our NAS members' uh, trips, uh, which tells us that on the August the 8th, uh, she broke adrift from the tug uh, and was searching the channel for a day on the 8th of August, and boom, that was it. Um, Ennis McCartney, the submarine historian and, and maritime archaeologist, uh, reckons that these things would have been a pig to tow, would have been really difficult to tow. And if it was just any sort of slightly lumpy sea, I suspect the bargeman would have just cut the lines or I'm sorry, just let it go, uh, for not risking themselves. She was found in 1995, or discovered in 1995, by recreational divers, Joey Dowd, as they drove their boat over, their echo sounder over a, a lump on the seabed, uh, and then later went back and dived it reported to Innes McCartney that they'd found a, a Holland-class submarine. Uh, Innes tells a story that he said, no, you haven't found a Holland-class submarine. And they went, no, we have found a Holland-class submarine. And eventually Innes dives it with them, confirms that it is a Holland-class, and it's then designated by Historic England or English Heritage at the time uh, in 2005 to become a protected wreck. This is what she looks like on the seabed. This is some uh, multi-beam sonar imagery from um, 2016 undertaken uh, with Historic in England funding by uh, MSDS Marine and Suede Services for us. It's a little cigar on the seabed of what is pretty much a flat, featureless seabed. There's a few rocks, uh, or even this may be concrete, we think, which is perhaps something to do with any attempts uh, at any point to um, recover it. There's a sand ridge that runs off one side. There's a bit of a scour at the bow and a bit of a scour at the stern. On the seabed, she looks like this, completely bolt upright, as I said, with the conning tower still visible. And we've got engineer's drawings, so we can compare what we see on the seabed with the engineer's drawings uh, for how Holland uh, envisaged um, the construction of these submarines. We can see that the, the conning, uh, the bow cap uh, has gone missing at some point during 2010. Uh, it went missing, it was reported on the diving press as being stolen, but we don't know that for sure at all, that it was stolen. But what you can see is some of the fishing gear that's been littered in the site over any point. And these two holes here are the largest holes in the entire pressure hull of the submarine, the, the hull. So you can't see inside, you can't see what's inside uh, the submarine other than being able to put a small camera uh, in there. We did for an episode of Time Team, which I remember fondly with uh, Phil coming out onto the boat with us uh, many years ago, stick a camera down the torpedo tube, five and a half meters down the torpedo tube, uh, to see whether or not the inner door was open or closed. Uh, what we did confirm is that a conger reel lives inside it, because I poked it up the backside uh, uh, with, a, with a camera, uh, which it didn't take too kindly to. Uh, but we did also hit a hard surface. We hit a hard return. So we're fairly certain that the inner door is closed. Um, but you can see all the, the fishing gear and these two holes, the propellers uh, at the stern. Now, back in 2012, technology was such that, for me, photo mosaicing of this submarine by sort of stitching together eight or ten photographs going down one side was pretty much the pinnacle of you know, how we were going to record this very quickly within a single dive. Of course, things have advanced, as we've seen over this weekend. 
quite dramatically, uh, and uh, we have also been applying the same sort of modern photogrammetry techniques for this. Um, sometimes you can't measure the holes and you can't record the submarine that well because of the marine life. Um, uh, Sarah Hassan, who was uh, awarded her fellowship yesterday at the NAS AGM, came back from a dive once saying, I didn't measure the hole for you, and that was the only job she had to do. But why didn't you measure the hole? She said, I'll show you. And she got out her GoPro camera from the housing and played it back and said, I wasn't quite brave enough to go and measure that with my folded ruler. Um, now, to me, that's no sign of dedication. Uh, sometimes it can be quite black like that. The visibility can be quite dark. Although it's quite clear with the torches on it, it can be quite dark. But other times, it can just be phenomenally clear. It's so light, so much natural light on the site. Now, back in 2012, I, you know, I fairly said, we were one of the first organisations, this is one of the first sites, protected wreck sites, to have any kind of visualisation of what it looked like. Uh, Mike Postins from 3 Deep Media, uh, who was mentioned by Simon Brown on the Thistledorn talk yesterday, uh, developed for us using the multi-beam imagery, using the engineer's drawings to create a digital 3D model of the submarine, and then he plonked his little 3D model uh, on a fake seabed on the screen, and then we coloured it in, and we painted it, and then we took a rubber to it, and took a few things out, and said, well, that's not there, that's not there. And you could spin around through 360 degrees and zoom in, zoom out. But it was an artist's impression. It was, there was, no, it was no, no basis in science, really. There was no uh, millimetric or centimetric recording of it. Uh, and things, of course, have, have developed since then. Back in 2016, we got funding from Historic England as part of their uh, programme of funding uh, protected wreck sites to create virtual diver trails to try the Holland and to go from artist's impression to real data uh, on the site to create a, uh, an experience for the non-diver to, to uh, understand what's on the seabed and why it's there and protected, but also for visiting divers to do before they come and dive the site. Uh, and so um, using uh, Martin Davis at In-Depth Photography, uh, who's been taking pictures all weekend, uh, and we, we tried it out. Uh, and you know, this was, this is all a learning curve for everyone, although there's Simon doing it, and there's guys, Brandon at Maritime Archaeology Trust doing it, and Martin's doing it. They're all on this learning curve and hopefully sometimes sharing information about it, uh, about how to do it. Uh, and we proved proof of principle in the September of 2016 when Martin <coughs> produced this for us. So it's a digitized, it's a, it's a 3D model of about, I don't know, maybe 50 photographs uh, of that part of the submarine, the, the top bow section. And then in April 2017, Martin again dived with us and we started to put photo targets on the submarine uh, and went along the top and produced that for us. But, you know, no offence to Martin, it was a little disappointing <laughs> on the result. So, we went back and we tried again, uh, and in the June of 2017, nine miles offshore, this were, these were the conditions. So we are a long way out, so it's taken an hour and a half to get there, and this is what it looked like. I mean, I get more bubbles in my bath, uh, more waves, more wave action in my bath than there was on the Sussex coast that day. Um, so, absolutely fabulous on the 15th of June. I think Martin took a lot of pictures and he processed them very quickly because, well, actually, we'll get, we'll get to that, but this is what it looked like underwater. So this is Martin uh, swimming around. I can't take any credit for the results. All I do is lay targets and photograph him or video him doing what he's doing. He's the person taking all the pictures. And unlike Simon Brown yesterday, he presses the shutter with his finger and gets finger ache uh, by the end of a dive. So we. This is 32 meters on a low tide. We're maxing out on our nitrox mix to get a richer mix as possible. We've got stage decompression with stage <coughs> so that we can uh, get an enriched mix of whether it's 70% or 80% uh, for a decompression uh, stop. And we've got the photo targets, the photogrammetry targets on the submarine for him to record uh, in there to get the overlap. Um, and I mean, we are doing a long dive. And the idea here is to try and get the whole submarine done in one single dive of 32 meters. Um, so he does, his, he does his bit, he goes home, he puts it into Agisoft, and the very next day, I get an email of that. And those are the only words I get as well. A little snippet of things to come. So this is the cloud sort of compare of, uh, or, or, of what is potentially about to come out of the computer, um, come out of Agisoft. Martin built a PC with about 13 different processors in it in order to cope with the requirement, the processing uh, power needed to do this. But I think he quite liked sending me that email uh, and whetted my appetite uh, for what was going to be coming next. And it didn't take very long before we did get from him the complete submarine from a single day on the 15th of June uh, of, last, of this year 
of just over 1,700 photographs that pretty much matched. I don't think Mark, I think five pictures didn't quite match in. Two in the end. Two in the end, sorry. Two in the end pictures <laughs> didn't quite match in with it. So we were, you know, we were fairly happy that we had done in one single dive probably the most comprehensive monitoring survey of the condition of the Holland 5 submarine that was possible to do. So you can spin it round through 360 degrees and you can see. Now, you know, Martin's good, but Martin, look. <laughs> he won't rest until that bit's done. So the, the, you know, the little white bit is the only bit of the submarine that we're, that we're missing at this stage. And downstairs today, there's been a screen, a monitor, and you've been able, well, somebody may have seen you, you know, may have had a chance to do it. But we can spin it through 360 degrees, we can zoom in, we can zoom out. All the marine life, the cup corals, the Devonshire cup corals, everything else, the dead men fingers are all from that single dive uh, in June. On the 22nd of June, I sent it, or Martin actually sent it to Alison James at Historic England, who'd been funding it, uh, and she very quickly, I think, uh, put, the, put the OBJ file onto the computer, stuck the, uh, stuck the VR goggles on in her living room, yeah, in your living room, and posted this on Twitter and sent me an email just about saying how staggering it was to sit there on the seabed, well, not on the seabed, sit in your living room, in the comfort of your house, and to go on a virtual dive of the Holland 5 um, submarine. So, you know, we took that that the client was happy. <laughs> what we then do is we give the data to Mike Postins, again at 3D Media, and we ask Mike to use the data to create a surface uh, which we can then uh, put in embed into any website we wish to, whether it's ours, anyone else's, Historic England's website, so that a member of the public can go on a virtual dive of the submarine. So that's what he does. He imports it, just like with the Thistledorn project. Uh, we give it texture. Um, he's using the real colours this time, so he's using the real, he doesn't have to colour it in green or brown. So he's using real information, real data as far as the colours are concerned. You can spin it around 360 degrees, you can click on video links, you can click on hyperlinks to websites such as the Historic England Register, uh, Historic List for England, and the NES website, etc. You can spin it through 360. The visual, the, uh, the resolution on this isn't quite so great, I'm afraid from what you can see, it looks much nicer down here. But this is just to give you an idea. Now I think, as a diver, which I am, if I could do this before I go and dive the site, well that's got to you know, really help um, my understanding of what it is that I'm looking at when I actually come and pay my 70 pounds or 65 pounds or whatever it is to go and dive these wrecks. I want to get as much, much out of that, much value for money out of that experience as I can. So if I can learn as much as possible about what it is I'm about to go and dive on before I get there, surely I'm going to have a much better experience. And of course you can do it after the event as well. At the dive show in Birmingham at the NEC in October, we beta tested this. Uh, we had some uh, uh, divers, some NES members as well, have a little play with it to give us a bit of feedback, to look for glitches in the matrix, so what wasn't quite working, what was working. Uh, and we even managed to, Alison brought along the VR, the goggles uh, from Historic England, and we got old and young having a play. And I think being able to stick them on really attracts people, because as soon as one person's got it on, everyone else is walking past going, what are they doing? What are they doing? Uh, I don't think anyone felt seasick doing it, but most people did sit down, though, didn't they, um, whilst they were there. Now, if you'd have told me 10 years ago when we started doing this that we were able to create this 3D data to create the 3D virtual reality, and even now, the next stage is to use that data to create 3D prints so that we can do, uh, with the support of uh, NES members, so with the support of Dave Johnston, who's 3D printer at work, and I don't know whether work knows this. <laughs> Edit that bit. Um, uh, 3D printer uh, can do a 3D print using the data. Another NES member, Ian Barefoot, which some of you may know, can paint it for us. We can create a, um, a very tactile experience. We can create souvenirs. Uh, and in fact, we, uh, we've had two made, uh, and he doesn't know this, but I'm actually gonna gift one as a thank you to Martin for all the work that he's done to create the file for us, to create the data for us, to create the experience. He's been looking at it enviously all weekend. <laughs> 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 So I've got, um, according to my timer, I've got about seven minutes, but I don't know, I might, I'll probably finish it a bit quicker. But I'm going to very quickly just do the other one. The second dive of the day that we do is the Normans Bay wreck. Uh, it's a very different experience, and this is the multi-beam sonar from 2016, again by MSDS Marine and Suede Services. Uh, as you can see, it's more like the traditional wreck site from, his, from the historic period, uh, scattered over what looks like a ship shape, 50 metres long, 10 metres wide, uh, with a few objects lying on the outside. It's on a stone ballast mound, it's 51 iron guns currently counting. 
um, on top of a stone ballast mound. There is definitely hull structure underneath. We have hull on one side and hull on the other side, which we believe to be uh, the port side and, and the starboard side, of course. The starboard side uh, being to the, uh, the east and the port side uh, being to the west. Uh, you've got a large anchor in the middle and all these guns lying around the outside. Now, up until 2016, all we really had for scientifically sort of having a site plan was side scan sonar, which wasn't a very good quality, uh, uh, wasn't very high resolution, really wasn't very helpful as far as mapping the site. Uh, but thanks to the multi-beam, uh, we've been able to um, uh, really narrow and really hone our uh, site survey plan, which I'm going to come to. Some of the guns look like this, they're lying flat, you've got 12 pounders, 18 pounders, you've got some of the details, the cascadars on the back, some of these corrosion gun fins on the top with our navigation line going around the site. There is the timber, so there's the hull. It's not always exposed. Sometimes some dives it is exposed and some dives it isn't. I'm obviously showing you the photographs from the best visibility. Uh, quite sometimes you wouldn't have any idea there was a gun and you wouldn't have any idea there was timber. Um, in 2011, with funding from Historic England again, we opened up a physical diver trail on the seabed. We laid navigation lines, we put markers on the seabed. Uh, we actually sunk a clump weight, which is two train wheels on the seabed, so that every diver can visit, managed by the NAS, can visit the site and have a, a good experience rather than just dropping down any old shot line and ending up anywhere on the site not knowing where they are. In 2016, we got really lucky. The visibility was just phenomenal. Um, I say phenomenal, it was like four meters, five meters uh, uh, for Norman's Bay, that is phenomenal. And Martin had a go at photogrammetry and was able to get the anchor, some of the guns, these guns form an arch, some of the lines are even visible, the ground lines are visible, and then we thought, well, April, 20, April seems to be quite a good time. Let's try April again this year. So we went back in April this year, and we got even luckier. The visibility in April again, 2017, was phenomenal. And we got very, very lucky with the anchor again there. And I had a go at drawing outlines around all the guns, I think, that are in this photo, bit of photogrammetry of the site. 21, I think, I got to in terms of total numbers of guns in this image. There's one of our buckets. There's the line. There's cave diving arrows around the site uh, there. We've been using the data in an archaeological context, we've been using the data to improve our site plan, to improve our understanding. We've incorporated or used Site Recorder, we've put all the data into Site Recorder to create a, a scale plan using the geo-reference uh, file of the uh, multi-beam sonar, uh, and we can now use it for ground truthing. So I can send divers on a distance and a bearing from a known point to go and look for something to see if they can find what an object is. We can use it to overlay the photogrammetry to create uh, uh, hopefully to improve again our understanding of all traditional outlined site plans uh, as you see obviously published in, uh, in magazines, articles uh, and BIGNA. So we've been investigating the wreck constantly um, since we started doing this in 2011 I suppose. It's partly by professionals, it's partly by um, uh, members, by as volunteers. Uh, so Steve Cook who received an award from Peter earlier on today has joined the team, uh, started helping out this year and I hope it's had a positive uh, experience and see it's not just having fun in the water. Our publication has just come out, so with the kind help of Peter Lefebvre and Frank Fox, we've had an article come out in IGNA online early, and in fact, thanks to Miranda and Wiley, it's now free for the time being, for the next couple of weeks to, to download. It helps my stats if you go and download it, by the way, um, everybody who's out there listening. Uh, so it gives us an idea of what works happened to date, and the fact that we think we have a plausible candidate for its identity. We now think we might know, we may think we might know how how unsure am I? We think we know it's a Dutch ship. We think it's the Weffen van Utrecht, uh, a 64 gun ship which sank in the Battle of Beachy Head in 1690, is what we think. So it's another one of Martin's, wherever he is in the room. When we gave the visualization uh, data, there's multi beam data and the um, photogrammetry data to Mike Postins again. Uh, I joined him in a pub in Penryn in Cornwall, as I happened to be there. He came from work and showed me this on his map, on his, on his screen. As to what the visualization could look like for the for the Norman Bay site, which uh, you know it's, it's pretty good. He can pick up a gun, he can drop it anywhere he likes <coughs> around the site. So I can tell him I think it should be a bit like this, or maybe up a bit more, etc. Uh, we've created the visualization now, and this is live on the internet. So on the NES page uh, under projects, you can find this. So you can do the virtual dive on it, the image of the Weffen van Utrecht, some hyperlinks to external information, and you can drop yourself down on the Norman's Bay site uh, and. I have to say in better visibility than is normally experienced, but you can, you can drop yourself down onto the seabed by clicking on one of the 360 icons and pretend that you are just swimming or moving around one way uh, or the other. 
So, you know, we're quite happy. And again, if, if you'd have told me a few years ago with the visibility that we normally experience and with the data sets that we had, that you'd be a, we'd be able to create this to the level of detail and accuracy that it has, I'd have, told, I'd have said you were kidding. There's no way that we're going we're gonna to ever get there. But no, it's, it's happened and we'll, we'll carry on doing it. We'll be improving it year upon year upon year, we hope. And we'll hope you'll join us. We hope you'll participate. We hope you'll help us to improve our understanding of our underwater heritage uh, on the seabed, the protected um, sites that we work on. These are the dates that we are going, that we take uh, visiting divers, that we take punters. Some people come back every year and they join us. I know March and April the water tends to be cold, but trust me, on Norman's Bay the visibility is probably going to be the best. Uh, by September the visibility on Norman's Bay is shocking. Uh, but uh, you know, April and, and March it should be good. There's information uh, on our website. Uh, I want to thank all the people that have helped to do the work that we've uh, undertaken. All the sponsors, the dive team, the volunteers that have helped out, the visiting divers that come along with us who go on a journey. They go on a journey of discovery. For them, most of the time, it's the oldest sites they've ever dived on, particularly with the Normans Bay site. It can often inspire them to get into archaeological diving. Uh, it can often uh, inspire them to do more with their diving. Uh, and if you are not a diver and you'd like to get involved, well, trust me, there is loads and loads of research potential in both of those sites. So I hope whether you're a diver and you want to dive them with your dry suit on, or whether you're not a diver and you'd prefer to do it from the comfort of your home and your sofa, then please do come on a journey with us. Uh, come on a journey of discovery into our underwater cultural heritage, uh, because trust me, it's fabulous. <laughs> Thank you very much.